India, which is where I'm from. I'm originally from India. I was born there. I moved here when I was eight years old. And the last time that I was in India was about seven years ago. Right? And when you're not in a country for that long, you kind of forget the subtle little nuances that really make that country special. Right? You forget how different it really is. And India, it's, it's different. <laughs> There's a lot of minorities in India. <laughs> There's about a billion of them, you guys. There's a billion minorities <laughs> in India, which is so exciting to see all those minorities in one place. <laughs> India is a truly different country. If you've never been to India, I highly recommend it. I think there's no, almost no country on the planet that's like India, right? India is a very energetic country. It's constantly buzzing. It's constantly moving. There's, it's so vibrant. There are all these colors. Holy fucking shit, the colors. <laughs> Fuck Roy G. Biv. We made some of our own. <laughs> and that can be very jarring. It can be very jarring for a group of people that think the color spectrum is only red, white, and blue. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think India is one of the very few countries in the world that has incorporated nature into its urban development, right? You know, we, we built around nature instead of over nature. You know, there's a point when people were building the cities in India where all the construction had to come to a halt and they were like, what do we do? There's a tree here! <laughs> and they're like, I don't know, maybe we should try building around it. <laughs> That's probably what it wants us to do. Technically speaking, it was here first. <laughs> a lot of different animals in India, too, that, that li live in the cities, right? Uh, cows. There's a lot of cows in India. A very holy animal uh, in India, the cow. It's a, the cows are just like in the middle of the road, not giving a shit about your Toyota. <laughs> they have transcended the traffic that they are 100% responsible for. <laughs> There's a lot of monkeys in certain parts of India as well, right? Uh, especially down south, there's monkeys that live in the city in India. We got to see some of them when we were down there. We were in Bangalore, and my wife and I went uh, for lunch with, at our favorite diner, uh, which is basically what we did when we went to India. We found the one restaurant that has all of our favorite Indian food, and then we went there every fucking day. <laughs> Even the restaurant owner was like, hey, you know there's like other places you can go to. And we were like, hey, uh, shut the fuck up, bro. Don't tell us how to vacation, okay? We are American. We have provably never made wrong decisions in our lives. So we grab our lunch, we're sitting down, and across the street from this restaurant, there's a little park, right? And we see these monkeys, and they jump down, they're scouting out the location, making sure it's okay for the rest of the troop to move forward. And in this park, there's a little boy, like a three-year-old boy, right? And he sees these monkeys, and then he points at them, and he picks up some leaves, and he throws it at the monkeys. Now, I have never seen a wild animal get that pissed off at a tiny human before. <laughs> But it was fucking hilarious. Yes. <laughs> the monkey was like, are you fucking kidding me with this shit? <laughs> I mean, that thing knows, right? It knows I'm more physically dominant than it. Yeah. Right? I will rip its face off right now. I will do it. Okay? This is bullshit, Sanjay. Okay? Every couple of weeks, we got to move the troops because of these assholes. Every couple of weeks, we got to do it. Okay? These things are in charge of the planet. Really? That thing is in charge of the planet? That thing just shit itself! <laughs>
Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the program. Hope you guys are doing well. We're back at the right time today. <laughs> back at the usual hour. I'm a little late. I'm a little late. We're we're actually starting a couple minutes late uh, today, but uh, but rel relatively uh, around the same time that I normally do my streams. We're we're back in action with it. Uh, Fred, good to see you. Dolores over on Facebook. Hello, how are you? I hope you're still watching, hanging out with us. Uh, thank you guys for for tuning in. A uh, couple of couple of quick updates. Uh, as you guys, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys, guys caught the Graham Elwood stream yesterday. Graham had me on his show uh, to talk about what's going on with my car, what's going on with the bank, and uh, and basically how I'm caught in this financial trap. And uh, and I know I'm not the only one. Uh, and and there might be people that don't know how to navigate uh, through this sort of stuff. And you know, I'm I'm trying to be open about this process so that people kind of know what to do, what to expect, uh, that sort of stuff. But, uh, yeah, I got a, I got a thing from, um, I got something else from the bank this morning it's through the better business bureau. So I made a complaint to the better business bureau because that, that has seemed to like scare the scare various institutions enough that they will, they'll be like, okay, well, let's figure out what we need. Cause I, you know, I think, I think it it still affects them in some in some way, shape, or form. If they can't settle a, a dispute, you know, without getting the Better Business Bureau involved, and then once the Better Business Bureau is involved, like you know, but they're they seem to be pretty confident that they're going to win out on this, which I don't think they will, because um, I have I have this letter that is that is three weeks late, and it's got a bunch of wrong information on it. Um. Which is which is like crazy. So like, I contacted the Better Business Bureau and I told them what's going on, and they were just like, "Yeah, just refuse the, you know, like this is not an explanation for them to do what they did." And if you if you see all this information that's wrong in the letter, you know, like my address is wrong, the date that I talked to this woman is wrong, uh, the there there's something that they did that like I had basically like made an arrangement to not happen and it's and that arrangement was in writing like she actually gave it to me in writing um because the what they, I mean what the, the long and short of it is what they were doing was to, like I would make overpayments right like I would pay like 40 bucks over and they were taking that forty dollars and applying it to the the following month's minimum balance which is not a thing that any loan I've ever had has ever done. So that was very strange. And when I found that out, I was like, wait a minute, all the extra stuff is supposed to go to the principal. That's how all these loans work, not for Citizens One. And so when I complained about it, it went up to the office of the chairman. They fixed it up. And then it was it was like $1,500 difference in my principal amount. Like it was a significant amount of difference because I was paying directly into the principal. And, and it was bringing that amount down. Um, and, uh, and so I had basically like been through all of this stuff, uh, to, to, to make sure that they weren't doing this thing. And I found out that they were, there's a lot of discrepancies. Uh, they're, they're, they're also misrepresenting me by saying like, I'm, I'm trying to not make payments, which is also super not true. So, you know, all this stuff is in there. And so she was just like, decline it, decline that offer. And uh, and put in what you want, and if they don't come back with uh, with with the with with that offer, you can decline it, and then you have to escalate it to the office of the attorney general. And there's a department of banking for every single state, and so it, it just gets escalated to that department. So, like that's where the process is going right now. And I and and you can you know you can check out the Graham Elwood interview to kind of get all the ins and outs and details of all that. Um, but uh, but yes, that's. That's what's going on with that. Um, but, you know, uh, that aside, there are some very positive things going on in my life that I am trying to uh, concentrate on. And I just want to say the back end of StreamYard, like you guys can't see it. Uh, and I don't know how to fucking show you guys or anything. But they did a little bit of a I mean, it's just a minor overhaul on the aesthetics of the back end. And it looks like significantly better, probably because they're using like a font that I really like. They're using Futura, which is a weird, nerdy design 
thing, but like, I mean, the fonts that they're using, phenomenal, fantastic. It looks really great. So kudos to the StreamYard people. Uh, keep up the good work. But I wanted to mention show announcement, show announcement, people. Uh, I'm bringing my new show, Citizen Revolution, uh, to Lansing's Robin Theater, a a, a venue that is uh, near and dear to my heart. It's a beautiful fucking space. Uh, wonderful people. Dil Dylan and Gina D are are just uh, delights to be around. They're like wonderful people. Uh, and I was super fucking bummed because every October it became a thing, right? It was like a date that I looked forward to. And right before the pandemic, Dylan and I had a, uh, a fantastic conversation that's available for you to listen to on my podcast, Taboo Table Talk. And we talked about coming through in, in October and I was really excited. But then the pandemic happened and obviously it would not have been responsible to come through. And uh, and I missed it. You know, I, I missed that place. So back at it. Tickets are available. That's the link right there on the screen. It's in the comment section of uh, of all of the streaming stuff that you want. Or you can go directly to my website or the Robin Theater's website and uh, and grab your tickets there. So if you're in Lansing, I I I very much hope that you can you can come out to see the show. If you're in Pittsburgh, if you're in Pittsburgh, um you know, come come on out to the Irma Freeman Center for Imagination on August 14th. Uh, for both these shows, limited tickets. So you got to grab them and you got to grab them quick because uh, they are they are on there. They will they'll fly off the shelves. You don't want to miss out on these shows. Very the, And the Pittsburgh show is the first time I'm going to be doing the hour top to bottom in front of a live audience. So super pumped about that. So grab those tickets. Come hang out. Uh, and yeah, uh, Shane, Shane's asking, did you, did I find an attorney over the bank shady practices? Shane, I have not, not yet. I am still in 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 the hunt for it. Uh, it's hard, man, because what you know what happened to me on Monday is I dealt with this stuff for five hours and completely tapped out. Like I had no steam and energy to do much of anything. That's why I didn't do a stream on Monday. I couldn't focus on on any article I was reading or any of the research I was doing. And you know, if I would have done a stream, it would have just been this ranty angry exhausted fucking stream and i don't think anybody would have had fun anybody would have learned anything we wouldn't have been talking about anything important but i am on the on the lookout for um you know trying to trying to get an attorney to to because i feel like i'm because that's i feel like that's where things are headed um so that's still that's still up in the air at the moment but i am hunting i am looking um so yeah uh we got we got Fred. We got Holly over on the Rockfin. Uh, Holly says, "I hope you have uh, good documentation." I have uh, I have a decent amount of documentation, uh, like the weird shit that they did, where they where they took a portion, like the overpayment from from like February of 2020, and applied it to July of 2020, was something that they should not have done. Uh, and even on the check, I write, you know, I wrote. Uh, you know, additional amount to principal. And clearly they're not doing that. So they're not respecting what I want. They're not respecting the agreement that we have in writing. Uh, and, and they're, and they're going to make some cockamamie claims. Um, you know, they're going to use circular language. So I have a lot of stuff documented. Uh, you know, I have like two copies of this letter that they sent through the BBB one with all my notes on it. And one just is the letter. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking as many precautions as I possibly can. Um, you know, I have dates and, uh, of, of when phone calls were made. I have dates, uh, for when letters were received, you know, I didn't get prior warning to any of this stuff. They moved my thing to a different department and they're basically like, Oh yeah, but you know, I wrote this out and sent it on Monday. So you should have received it soon and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, well, I still don't have a statement in my hand. And if I don't make this, if I don't make this payment, then you guys are going to claim that I'm, I'm trying to escape making payments. So they're manufacturing this view as if I'm trying to es skip out on making payments. In fact, that's also something that they said in the letter is that uh, I, I spoke about uh, skipping payments which again misrepresentation never said that i actually kept saying how i'm 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 glad to make the payments on the car i purchased a car i'm glad to make the payments on it i would you know like to be the owner of this vehicle at, at, like several different times so yeah it's just it's just a lot of um you know misrepresentation and stuff 
And uh, and I, I thank you guys for for tuning in and hanging out. I know it's kind of been a little bit of a wonky week. Um, uh, Sh Shane's mentioning someone that can help. Uh, I I would uh, I I unfortunately I can't only because I need to find someone that's in my county. Um, but thank you for for the recommendation. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, it, it, it in in this circumstance, it has to be within my county. Uh, but the Better Business Bureau stuff is like that has the, the complaint has to be, um, you know, looked at by a, the, the BBB in their region. So their region is Massachusetts. They're in Rhode Island. So, uh, yeah, so that's where things are with that. A very, very complicated, exhausting and tiring process. I'll, I'll tell you that. So I'm trying to I'm trying not to have too many repeats of what happened to me on Monday. And what happened to me last week, which is just like dealing with it for extended periods of time and then completely, you know, tapping out, exhausted, can't can't really do much with it. So uh, but yeah, thank you very much for your help and support and and, and you know, coming back and tuning in and and uh, being with me on on this super fucking wonky week that I'm that I'm having. So, so let's dive right in. So uh, last week I did a, a, a you know a segment about uh, the Hindutva, which is the far right uh, Hindu nationalist theocratic wing of of Hinduism that has glommed on to the BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the conservative party of India that's currently the ruling party in India. Uh, the prime minister is of that party, and I had kind of you know, I'll say wavering views because I was getting a lot of information from family, from some people there. And, you know, as it was, some people didn't like the didn't like Modi. Other people did. Um, I looked at a lot of his policies and, you know, some of his policies early on or in, in, in like 2014, 2015, when he was coming in, were policies that I would say were an attempt, an attempt to help people, um, such as digital literacy. He wanted to implement digital literacy as part of, um, you know, uh, India's growth. That he wanted everybody to have access to the internet. He wanted everybody to have access to a cell phone. And he said that it was going to be younger women in these villages that are going to be the ones that are going to be leading the charge in educating people on how to be technologically savvy. Cool. Uh, he tried to privatize healthcare. That failed. Um, he admitted it failed and tried to implement a somewhat universal healthcare system. You still have to sign up for it. You still have to, like, you know, again, have access to the internet. Uh, he tried to fight corruption in India by getting rid of some of the larger bills so that there's less money laundering happening. But it's a cash society, and he didn't give enough time for people to get to the city, open up a free checking account so that they can move a bunch of their money into this checking account. Uh, India is an incredibly underbanked country. I mean, America is an underbanked country as well. Like, I, I bet you if you fucking, you know, throw a stone at a globe, wherever you hit, it's fucking underbanked. There's a bunch of people underbanked. And India is no different. Um, there's a lot of underbanked people in India. So a lot of people lost a lot of money. But members of my family lost a shit ton of money because he took two large bills and uh, and demonetized them. And he said these are no longer valid, right? Like, which is also crazy, like, that governments have that ability, you know, that they can just kind of, like, tomorrow if somebody was like, yep, $20 bills, no longer fucking valid. Like, how many fucking people across America would be screwed? You know, so... Again, so I looked at those things and I was like, well, it looks like he's trying to help. But then you kind of can constantly you, you look at it even further. You know, he had a, he had a big controversy about uh, what happened in Gujarat in 2002, 2001, 2002. Don't quote me on those dates. I can't remember off the top of my head. But he basically like blamed the Muslims uh, which created a uh, for for uh, I think an explosion or something, he, uh, uh, some kind of terror attack, and he blamed the Muslims for it, and then a bunch of people started attacking Muslims. Go figure, 
right? Like there's all this nationalistic fervor. Oh my God, my country's been attacked. We blame Muslims. Everybody starts attacking Muslims. Gee, I wonder what that sounds like. It sounds like America post 9-11. Oh, it's the it's the Islamic terrorists. Oh, every Muslim is a terrorist now. Burn down mosques, right? That's what that's what the mentality is. You stoke fear. You use nationalism to stoke fear. That's what you get. And so then he had to come out and he, he didn't say anything. But when he was running for prime minister, he apologized to the Muslim community. And the Muslim community was like, OK, we accept your apology. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you are excused um it it does not mean that you get to uh do this again it means that now you have to be better to the muslim community and now he's not you know look at what's happening in kashmir it's the most militarized place on earth they restricted internet they restricted tourism they restricted uh a, a lot of different things people in in kashmir are suffering they're under occupation they want to be their own nation and india is not letting them do that um, they, they never agreed to the plebiscite. They don't, they, they didn't, they never put an interim government in place. Uh, and they want demographic control of Kashmir because, the, because the Kashmir Valley is very important to a lot of resources, to a lot of travel points. Uh, look at the, the citizenship bill where they were basically going to try to screw over a bun bunch of, uh, Indians that are Muslim. So more and more it became evident that, okay, what seemed like somebody trying to do their best was really just somebody covering their tracks to do some heinous shit. Uh, and, and, you know, again, it's like he did a couple of nice things. Kind of. He's I'll, I'll put it this way. He said a couple of nice things. He never implemented them. He tried to do something that was good, but then he fucked it up. And part of that is because probably because he's out of touch, you know, and this is a guy that came from the working class. Uh, but the major thing that Modi and the BJP kind of talk about is uh, is being Hindu. They talk about be like Hindu nationalism. Right. That's that's a big part of the of the political sphere in India right now. Is are you Hindu? Or are you not? Uh, you know, after after the partition, there was a lot of violence. A lot of violence because the country was split. The British decided that India was going to be a Hindu country. The Constitution of India says that they're a secular nation. So why are we going along with the the narratives of the colonizers that India kicked out 70 some odd years ago? Why are we going along with that narrative? Never makes any sense to me. But that is part of the dialogue and the conversation is that it, in order to be a true Indian, uh, you have to be a Hindu. And for, you know, for the diaspora, which is which is overseas, you know, people that are living overseas, I, I would be part of the diaspora because I was born in India and I moved here. So I would be part of the diaspora. Well, part of the diaspora the the problem ends up becoming that uh you know these hindu nationalists the bjp don't consider us hindus don't consider us indian even because we are not the the we we don't belong to the same faction of hinduism that they do um you know and my like my family is brahmin but i don't really consider myself one because that's a very traditional very conservative kind of way of living. And that is not, that is not what I, uh, what I am, you know, it doesn't match my identity. So I stopped believing that. And look, I grew up in it. You know, I was steeped in it. I did the whole thread ceremony and all that. So like, I know what the religion is. I know what, the, what it says. I know the tenants, the stories, the, the rituals and all that kind of stuff. But the second I stopped believing in it, the second, according to these folks, I am no longer Indian. So what that boils down to is having pride in your country, whether you lived there, whether you were born there, or whether you have some ethnic uh, connection there, uh, and and supporting human rights are not mutually ex exclusive, right? Like you can still be a, a an Indian, uh, not Hindu, and still be critical of India. Again, according to the BJP, according to the Hindutva, according to these these very militant Hindus, no, you can't. 
right? Like it's a very strict definition of what Hinduism is, very strict definition of what being truly Indian is. Um, I think that's bullshit. I don't think I don't think having pride in your country and pride in your faith, uh, whatever your faith might be, and championing human rights are mutually exclusive. You know, it's not one or the other. It's not like just because I'm a citizen uh, of of America and and uh, I'm I'm born in India, I can't criticize either of these countries. And because I'm critical doesn't mean that I don't like these places. You know, I want this country to be better. I want this country to to live up to what it what what it's what it it advertises itself as. That would be awesome. I I want India to do the same thing. But they're not right now. You know, you can't come out and say you're a secular nation, but then say, oh, but if you believe in this religion, this philosophy, this way of life, f go fuck yourself. Like that's not that doesn't make any any sense. So the, I mean, the, so they they claim they claim that you're not right, and and here's the crazy part is there's a lot of violence against against Muslims in India from Hindus, um, you know, and I don't particularly think this is a terrible law based on what the country is, but I can understand uh, they they want to they want to like stop anything to do with beef and cow killing and all that sort of stuff. And I, I understand, I understand that, but you can't make that illegal because then you are, then you are, you know, you are making laws based on religion. You can't say, you can't do that and then claim you're a democracy. Again, there's that hypocrisy that we face whenever we see people uh, use religion as a vehicle for nationalism. America is the greatest country in the world. We're the greatest democracy that's ever lived. But we're a Christian nation. If you're not Christian, then you're not American. It's like, hmm. There's no violence in most of these religions, right? Most of these religions don't talk about violence. Um, and if they do, it, it's, it's in defending yourself from... Um, an outside aggressor. The Sikhs are an incredibly peaceful people. Their their philosophy is to help people that need help. Uh, they they are they are people that I've seen go out of the way to help people that need help. That's what they do. Uh, but you know they often get confused for 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 Muslims because of the beard and the turban and all that. Uh, but then, you know, because they carry a sword and people associate violence with Islam. And so they go, oh, you're carrying a sword, so you must be violent. No, no, that sword is for defense. Because within the Sikh philosophy, if if you are attacked, then you have the right to defend yourself. But you, as as a human being, don't have the right to take life one way or the other. That's not that's not something that we can do that according to their and I agree with that, too. I, I don't think it's up to me to decide to extinguish life of any kind. For, for fuck's sake, I, I had a I had a meltdown because I ran over a possum on the highway. I didn't slow down fast enough and I heard it roll under my car and I kind of freaked out. Uh, I think Ron Placone, I was on the road, uh, I, I opened for Ron Placone. So like, you know, I, I drove and, and he helped cover gas and like we split a bunch of stuff. Uh, but yeah, like I hit a possum and it was Ron and I was dating a girl at that time. And I ran over this possum and we were in the middle of like this really deep conversation. And I kind of freaked out. I just don't deal like it's just not a thing that I'm comfortable with. I don't like I believe in that Sikh philosophy. Now, if somebody's aggressing towards me, I do have the right to defend myself. But that doesn't make it violent. That doesn't make it that doesn't make the core tenets of this religion about violence. Same thing with Hinduism. So the people that 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 claim that they're Hindus and they need to exterminate Muslims, yeah, that's not Hinduism, man. That's you're also not defending yourself from anything. So I look at that. I look at that law that bans, you know, beef that makes, you know, anything related to to 
using any aspect of a cow for 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 clothing, food, et cetera, et cetera, illegal. Well, that's a that you're now we're in in some dangerous waters. I understand why you're doing it, but you know, Muslim communities don't have that. Muslim communities have a thing with pork. So if you make pork illegal, then I'm pretty sure a bunch of Indians who are not vegetarian, which also, by the way, I'm pretty sure is a part of Hinduism, or at least that's what that's how I was brought up. I was brought up that being a vegetarian was an aspect of being a Hindu because you have respect for 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 the you know fauna because animals have a place within our community. They help us do certain things, right? So so you don't eat the the creatures that are helping you do a thing, and and you know in some respects it's like plants. Um, we can eat them because they're that's kind of what they're here to do is is to kind of provide nourishment and all that sort of that's hindu so if you're if you're claiming that you're a hindu but you're eating pork yo i don't know how you can do that what i mean what i grew up with that those are those are against the rules the problem is that you know we is the human interpretation of uh, these spiritual teachers, the sages, the priests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We take what they teach and we apply it to, you know, to 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 our personal emotions. And we go, I'm feeling X, Y, Z about this particular thing. What does my religion say? Oh, my religion says this. I'll go do that. I interpret this as, uh, you know, my anger is validated and my my hurt is validated and through this, through my interpretation of what this sage and priest has said, I'm allowed to go hurt this other person now. The issue that that I think a lot of religions fall into is this is is they feed into this in, uh, and not uh, man, this this gets a little complicated. So I apologize that I'm kind of a little jumpy. But I want I want to try to get this right, and it's it's up here. It's just vocalizing it that sometimes gets difficult. So so let's see if I can do that. What organized religion does, uh, you know, and I'm including extremist viewpoints in this as well. The evangelical Christians, the extremist Muslims, the Hindutva, uh, the Zionists. Yeah. Okay. They're all part of organized religion. It gives you something to be a part of. Right? Like you can wear a thing. Like this is, this is, I have a, I have a little thing of Sai Baba. Um, I like what Sai Baba had to teach. I like what he had to say. I thought he was a pretty cool dude. Okay. So that's why I kind of wear, you know, um, and you know, my, my mom likes it. I've, it's also a comfort thing. I've had this on for quite some time, but, um, you know, that's what these organized religions do. They give you the, a, a, a sense of belonging. And they take that sense of belonging. Um, and through that organization, they exploit it. For profit, for, for, for ostracization of another group of people. So they exploit it. That's what they do. They love doing it. It's it's the thing that it's the thing that organized religion does best. And how do they exploit it is, again, most of these religions, if you really look at them, if you really read what what they say. Right. The core aspect of it. And I know the Bible has some weird shit. I know the Old Testament has some weird shit. I know the the, the Quran and and the Bhagavad Gita and all of these fucking books have some weird shit in them. Have you met humans? Come on. We have scatolo scatological porn. We do weird things. OK, that's just what we that, that's. We we got the cognitive leap. So we were like, hey, what if I wonder if we can, you know, use a jar for sex. And then we and then we figure it out. Right. Like we do weird shit. I get it. I understand. But the core tenets of these religions, though. Is not fear. Is not hatred. Is not, hey, this person believes something two degrees off of what we believe in, kill them. That's never, I mean, if you look at it as a way of life, how is that sustainable? 
and to me that's what religions are if you're if you're going to say that you're a religious individual or you're or or you have some kind of spiritual leaning in one way shape or form that is a that is a way of life you are choosing to live your life in a particular way i'm agnostic uh, you know, I've, I've always said curiosity is my religion. I like to learn things. I like to listen to people's perspectives and, and try to impart knowledge when I, when I have knowledge, right? I live my life that way. If, if you're, if you're a Hindu and you are, and, and your whole fucking central basis for existing is being a Hindu makes you more Indian, and if you're not a Hindu, then you're not Indian, and henceforth, I will eradicate you from my country, I'll eradicate you from my culture. You're not Hindu, man. That's not what Hinduism is about. Nowhere in these books does it say, if they don't belong to your religion, then you should go kill them. That is a manufactured interpretation of these, of, of these teachings used for power and wealth. That's it. Organized religion is the problem. So here's here's some things that should be organized, right? I'm not shitting on organization. Here's some things that we can we 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 I think should be organized. Workers, uh files, documents, socks, organize your socks, you know? That's important. Sometimes I've done it. I've I've not organized my socks, and then I got long sock on one side, ankle socks on the other. It just gets weird. It's uncomfortable. Weed, weed should be organized. You should know. You should know what your indicas are, what your sativas are, what your hybrids are, what your sativa dominant hybrids are, what your indica dominant uh, hybrids are. Dosages and how they affect your body. Organize that shit. Get a spreadsheet going. I got to do that. I got a spreadsheet in in that little thing back there. That I gotta run through and write down, you know, hey, this is th this weed and is this kind of thing, and this is how it makes me feel, and this is what it's good for, yada yada yada. Organize that shit. Things that should not be organized. Religion. End of list. Don't organize your religion. Why? Because it separates it from becoming a way of life. It separates it uh, from from the teaching. And and then and then you're and then you're in a clubhouse and clubhouses have rules and agendas and certain people aren't allowed. It creates uh, uh, feelings of resentment, feelings of 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 isolation. You know, don't organize that shit. Let it be a little bit more freeform, right? Like you can let people let people's uh, philosophies evolve a little bit more. You gotta let you gotta let people evolve, and and I think once you organize religion and put it within a box, you're not letting people evolve. You're keeping people within a certain point of tradition, and you're keeping people within a certain point of of definition. So when the Hindutva comes out and says, "Well, if you're not Hindu, then you're not truly Indian," well, that's a whole load of crock of shit. So the question then becomes, is it necessary for you to be a Hindu in order to be truly Indian? And according to 64% uh, of Indian adults in 2019, uh, they said that, uh, I haven't noted it down wrong, but they said, yes, you, they they feel like their, their Indianness, if you will, is very much connected to being Hindu. Um, I disagree with that because being Indian is not about a religion. That is a part of the world that you are from. It, 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 there's aspects of culture and there's a history and all the stuff that that comes with being a Hindu. And that's in your blood. That's in your DNA. Religion really doesn't have anything to do. It can be a part of it, but it's not the defining factor of it. Uh, the Pew Research, the same Pew Research that found that 64% of Indian adults said that it you know in order for them to feel like they're hindu or, or truly indian they they need to be hindu uh that same research found that uh people said respecting other religions is just as crucial to being truly hindu so how can that be so how can the hindutva come out and say that they're truly indian because they are the most hindu of all hindus and 
if it's also true that it's crucial for you to respect other people's religion in order to be Indian, but then at the same time you're disparaging Muslims and in some instances Christians and Catholics that live in that country too, and treat them as secondhand citizens, how can you truly be Indian at that point? Some discrepancies in that situation. It's it's the same thing as as saying you're not truly American unless you believe in the Bible. You're not truly, uh, you know, uh, a, a Jew. Well, I guess for, for, in terms of Israel, it's like you're not really a Jew unless you believe in Israel. Like that's just a whole other fucking clusterfuck of things that I've talked about several times. Um, but yeah, I, you know, as somebody that lives here, I've heard that a lot from Indian people. Uh the stand-up clip that you saw, which on my album, Politely Angry, is track two or three or something. Um, that bit, you know, either Indian people loved or hated. I'm not trying to make fun of India. I'm accurately dis de trying to depict what India is like and juxtaposing it to what it's like here. You know, there there's more vibrancy in that country. People don't get offended if you talk to them on the streets or something like that. It's crowded. There's movement all the time. Like there's America's kind of static. We're we're a very private, individualistic country. We value that. Look, I, and I value certain things to be private as well. But it's to a different. So that's what. I, but Indian people. There are certain Indian people. There was one Indian guy that got really, really fucking mad. I wrote about it, and this guy was a lefty. You know, had Spock on his fucking banner, and was all about BLM and stuff. And basically said, "I'm just as bad as Russell Peters and his racist bullshit." Um, I'm disparaging Indians. I'm setting Indians back. Uh, at least Russell Peters is funny, which is like what? There's so many hypocrisies in that statement too. But. Other Indians have claimed that I'm not Indian because I grew up here and I don't, I'm not Hindu anymore. So, you know, talking about this stuff is kind of important because I can't be the only one that feels that way. All right. I'm going to look at your comments. Ba -da -bum. <laughs> Fred, Fred says I... <laughs> Don't we all? Uh, Holly's uh, Holly asks a good question. What kind of support does Modi have generally? Oh, I he's he's got a lot of support in India actually. Um, the, the it's it's not like eighty percent of the people, but I think there is a decent majority support of him and the policies. Uh, even even uh, Indians here really support him. What I mean, what you really got to realize about a lot of Indians here is that a lot of Indians here, especially first generation Indians that came here in you know the the eighties, nineties, early two thousands, even even going so far as the the seventies, um, you know they they came here in the pursuit of of a better life and wealth and all that sort of stuff. So they are actually pretty Republican when it comes to their support. They're very conservative when it comes to their support. So they look at someone like Modi and they go, yeah, this guy's doing what we want. He's upholding the Brahmins. He's upholding the upper castes of India. He is really bringing Hinduism back to the to the glory that it was. I mean, it's it's kind of the same mentality as the MAGA folks. Right. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Zozovix, good to see you. Thank you for joining. Uh, bu -bu -bu every time somebody leaves a comment, it just scrolls to the bottom, so I missed the earlier comments. Uh, Diaspora, euphemism for spermatogenesis, uh, except what, what was that? Except on Earth. I don't know if I fully understand that statement. <laughs> Uh, Zosvik says, I don't even like dressing up. T-shirts and shorts, good enough for me. No jewelry, not even a watch. I'm very selective about my jewelry, but I do, I will say this. I miss, I wish, I do miss wearing my watch. Uh, lost, lost the watch in, uh, in the divorce somewhere, uh, which is unfortunate because it was a pretty dope watch. Uh, but I do miss wearing a watch. I like, I like having a watch. Uh, rings, I'm pretty ambivalent on. I don't really care. This, the, the this, I've had on for quite some time. And like I said, you know, 
my mom believes in Hinduism pretty regularly, uh, pretty heavily, I should say. So, you know, this is something that that's kind of important for her. And, you know, I, I, at this point, I've just had something around my neck for so damn long. It, it, it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's like a part of me at this point, you know, like I need to have it on, um, Hamza. Hamza points out that Alex Jones is going to join Rockfin next week. Oh man, that's gonna be interesting. That's really that's gonna that's gonna be kind of weird. Uh Zuzvik says, I don't like how it feels. It's it's like it just oh, I totally get that. Yeah, I I like I have earrings and they have to be pretty small in order for me to uh um to to wear them. I don't like big gaudy jewelry. Uh that stuff bothers me a whole lot. Uh even even like the wedding band that I got was like a simple, it's just gotta be real simple. I, I like minimalist stuff. So yeah, I don't, I, I don't like wearing too much jewelry. Uh, so those also says Sam Harris and his map of the world and where you live and how that determines your religion. Like 99% of the time is a very good map to show people when they are lost in religion and the worser aspects of it. That's interesting. I'll have to check that out. Uh, I'm not a huge Sam Harris guy. Um, yeah, I'm not a huge Sam Harris guy, but I will have to check that out. That does sound uh, that does sound interesting. Fred says the Bible exists. I don't believe it. It, it is direct for for uh, from God verbatim. I, I don't. I don't think so either. I I think you know there there needed to be a way to find some order and some kind of chaos. And so here we are. We have some religious texts. Uh, you know, I think there's a good chance that Jesus was a real dude that walked around and preached some shit and said some things that uh, were controversial that, you know, the uh, uh, the heads of these religious institutions didn't particularly care for. Uh, he also wasn't a big fan of bankers. And that was kind of the tip off for, for, for him to be crucified. So, um, uh, criticism of Tulsi for being pro Modi and anti Muslim. Yeah, that was something I talked about. Uh, so the research I did, I talked about it in 2019. The research I did and the Glenn Greenwald interview with her, her, from what it looks like, her parents have a direct connection to Modi. I don't know how much of a connection she has to Modi other than that proxy. Um, I don't know if she's anti Muslim though. It would be, again, it would kind of be really odd. It would be like the Title IX thing. Uh, if she came out and said some anti-Muslim stuff, I believe that it would be very odd uh, for her to say that because she is so much like, uh, you know, hey, we, ha we have to embrace other religions. We have to learn from them. We have to, you know, accept each other for our differences. So... If if she has said anything anti-Muslim, I'm not I'm not aware of it, um, you know. Uh, but if, if you if you have a clip or something like that, uh, you know, please do let me know, and uh, and I will I will look into that because that is uh, that'd be kind of fucked up. That'd be kind of fucked up. Uh, it, yeah, it, it would it would definitely throw me for a loop. Uh, Zuzvik says, saw you on slow news day. Yeah. I've, I've started co-hosting on action for Assange. Um, every, every other Tuesday I will be co-hosting with them, which is very exciting. Uh, Shane asks a question. Do you follow Vandana Shiva? She's another one of my favorite Indian people. Yes, I do. She's fantastic. Uh, she's actually a wealth of knowledge when I did my, uh, I, I did a video on why organic food is so expensive um, and went into some of the stuff that Monsanto was doing and how Monsanto was affecting India. Uh, she's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to that sort of stuff. So if you haven't, if you guys haven't checked out Dr. Vandana Shiva, uh, I would very much recommend, uh, you check, check that out. She has a great interview from a few years ago that my friend Rolf, uh, pointed me out to on, uh, on Chris Hedges program called on contact, uh, excellent interview, really in-depth stuff. Uh, plus, it's hedges, so you know, uh, it, you you know, it's it's going to be good. It's going to be highly informative, and it's going to be bleak as fuck because <laughs> that's what hedges does, man. Yeah. All right, we got two more stories to get to, and uh, I'm 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 like 
a- approaching an hour already because <laughs> I talked way too much about that topic. There, I-, I thank you for letting me do that last segment, by the way, and and letting me get that off of my chest. That was just that that is that that aspect of it has been something I've wanted to talk about for quite some time. And and since we talked about the Hindutva last week, I figured why not address this this week. So, so uh, I want to get into this story. This story is super fun. Uh, so there, there's this uh, group in Amsterdam, the Anarcha Feminist Group, the AFG, and they're basically using squatting as a means to prevent gentrification, which I think is kind of fucking awesome, right? Uh, so squatting was legal in Amsterdam, right? As long as the building had been unoccupied for about a year, you could move your stuff in there and you 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 just squat in there until somebody buys up the property and so on and so forth. Uh, and then I think they got to go through a process. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I think they got to go through some kind of process to 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 legally evict squatters out of uh, out of their 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 homes, essentially. And I think in in New York City, is it a city law or state law? I can't remember. But I do remember listening to this podcast where it's a little complicated to do, and it falls into a little bit of a gray area in the United States, as as do most things. Uh, it's a little complicated to do, but if you have been squatting in a particular place for, I think, like up to three years or something like that, I might not have the numbers correctly. Uh, that place is legally yours, and they can't they can't evict you. You obviously have to prove that you've been you've been there for that amount of time that you have done a restoration of some kind to bring the place up to code and all that kind of stuff. Um, there was a group that did that, I think, back in the 80s and 90s in New York. They took over this warehouse, cleaned it up, made it like a place for homeless people. And it was like this big ass warehouse where a bunch of them lived and took care of it. Fixed up the electricity, winterized it, you know. And nobody could kick them out because they'd been there for so long and they'd done all this work to like make this place habitable that the city neglected, that the, you know, the, the, the landlords neglected. And so they were like, all right, that's yours. So that's kind of cool. In Amsterdam, it was legal. Uh, It was used as a, as a, as a protest tool in the sixties and seventies to prevent gentrification. So, so now these, these, the, uh, the AFG, the uh, anarcho feminist group is doing that same thing and in 2010 they actually made it illegal they made they made squatting illegal in amsterdam which kind of sucks um you know and and the movement that they talked about in the in the 60s and 70s that did that did um use squatting as 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 a uh, a tool for activists to prevent gentrification to prevent uh, you know, people from getting evicted and things of that sort. A lot of ups and downs. I mean, that's that goes without saying. That's kind of, like movements have that kind of problem all the time. Uh, but now they're like, yeah, we're ready to kind of face police intervention because this is this is not legal at this point. But this is a way that we can prevent them from, you know, tearing down our neighborhoods and making it less affordable. Uh, you know, so they were recently forced forcefully evicted out of certain buildings at the red light district that they were trying to prevent from being gentrified. And the cops came in, plainclothes cops, dragged them out. Uh, And, you know, the claim that this group is saying is, well, they want to bring these gentrifiers in and make Whoa. Are we still good? I'm hoping you guys can see the stream. Whoa, what the crap? Okay. All right. So it seems like it's back. Seems like it's back. Well, that was weird. Uh, and, uh, did not care for it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, so basically what they're saying is they're going to turn it, turn the red light district into the green light district, 
Um, it's going to be harder for sex workers to to do their jobs. It's going to be harder for people to afford sex workers. It's going to be harder for 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 those folks to afford, you know, working out of certain places going forward. And that's a problem. So they want to prevent that. They want to prevent this this uh, gentrification because this gentrification will essentially make this per this place Amsterdam. That when most people think of Amsterdam, they're like, "Oh man, like this, it's like this utopian fucking lefty paradise where you can get a whole bunch of weed and a whole bunch of sex workers and a whole bunch of mushrooms, and you can be high and drunk and getting a blowjob on the street and fucking in the street." And getting high again on the street. Like, they think, like, it's this super fucking free paradise. But as you can see, yet again, you have a bunch of capitalists coming in, trying to gentrify the place, turning it into a fucking strip mall, uh, you know, trying to trying to commodify all this crap. And and they're going to and, and now you're, you're going to see this place become more corporate and conservative. That happens everywhere. That's what they're trying to do with property. That's why they were so excited when they found out that small businesses are going to go under. Because those banks can re they foreclose on those businesses and sell that property at a much higher price than it's worth. We talked about this on Graham Elwood's show yesterday. You know, and I'm fortunate in this neighborhood that I live in that the businesses around here are like, no, fuck off. Fuck all the way off. We're not doing that shit. So right now, AFG is is squatting in a building. A lot of them have been evicted out of the red light district, but they're squatting in a building and they're and they're trying to use it as a resource center, um, so people can learn how to fight back against this sort of stuff. Uh, people can have some fine sort of sort of financial resource that they can use to you know. Um, to help themselves in uh, out out of poverty and and kind of fight the the system so that they're not they're not going to constantly get gentrified and their neighborhoods aren't going to constantly get destroyed. Yeah. So let me look at your comments. Uh, <laughs> there we got some we got some love for Vandana Shiva. That's awesome. Uh, Zozovix is asking, how do you prove it? Mailbox. That's a good question. So that was the one thing that they really didn't go into. Uh, it is how you prove it. I think if you can show that you have done some major restoration, um, like if you bring the power back, right? Like if you bring the power back uh, and, and pay the city an electricity bill, that kind of proves that, hey, you restored this. You did the restorative work. Now you're paying the electricity bill, that sort of stuff might be the way that they could do it. I think utilities are probably uh, the 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 way that they do it. Um, I could be wrong. That's a good question. I, I, I'll have to go and revisit that podcast. It's a super interesting podcast. I mean, it was an NPR podcast, but I was like really surprised as to what they were covering because they were covering some like real like they were covering like anarchist shit, which I was just like, really? Like you this is. All right, let's see how you guys fucking spin this thing. I think it it, it ended up being, uh, I I I feel like New York eventually shut that place down for some reason. Um, go figure, right? Uh, Fred says we need Dollar Trees on every block next to Starbucks. Good for good for the squatters. <laughs> well. Dollar Tree doesn't want to pay anybody, so they're not going to have any employees working there. So, you know. Oh, well, <laughs> if we lose Dollar Trees, uh, you know, a company that doesn't want to pay its employees properly, I'm not going to I'm not going to be too sad. All right, let's get to our final story. Uh, let's talk about Daniel Hale. Uh, and before we go on, I know Misty tweeted about uh, uh, Comrade Misty. Missy Winston tweeted about this earlier today about people covering uh, Daniel Hale, and it's and it, and it's not like I've been pressured into covering uh, this story or anything. I literally saw it. I, I was only going to cover the two, um, and and, uh, and then I, I saw Kevin Gastola article had just dropped. Um, 
about Daniel Hale's sentencing that's going to happen on Tuesday. And uh, and I was like, well, yeah, I, I, I want this to still be kind of in the forefront of people's minds uh, that this is happening in the United States. Um, so Kevin Gasola's article points out that they are trying to give Daniel Hale the harshest sentence that they could possibly give a whistleblower. Right now, uh, the U.S. government wants to put Hale in prison for nine years. Uh, they claim that he joined the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency to steal classified information. Uh, and when they, when people were like, oh my gosh, is that, is that true? Do you have any evidence backing that up? And they're like, yeah, we just said it. What more do you want? Do you not take, do, do you not believe the United States government? Do you think we're trustworthy? What the, f are you not a patriot? Like they got nothing. They got fucking nothing. So they're doing this bullshit where they're claiming claiming a bunch of stuff and then the prosecution goes on to say this right they, they say criminal penalties that are theoretically harsh but practically lenient are not sufficient first of all uh they are both theoretically and practically harsh uh you are you are trying to fucking demoralize and beat this individual because he exposed the president of the United States for having a kill list and how drones are used to kill innocent people. Uh, and then I get comments when I talk about this shit, right? Like the last time I talked about this, I brought up how there's a drone that uses six inch spinning blades to get its target. It literally had someone that goes, yeah, that's not true. It doesn't hurt other people. I'm sure it's a six inch spinning blade, but like it's it's it hits the target. It's meant to hit the target. It's like, yeah, but if the target is... First of all, if these things are inaccurate, they're going to just fire it into wherever. And let's say it's a crowded area. You don't think a six-inch spinning blade is going to fucking hit... Some, like, what? Second of all, why are you advocating for six-inch spinning blades to be put on explosives? They, are, they already explode. They blow up. What more do you fucking want? You fucking loony? Like, or the, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you advocating for six inch spinning blades to be added to missiles? What is this, fucking G.I. Joe's? Like, what? Uh, you know, and these are the people that look at what the United States government is doing and by, by saying that, you know, these, quote, theoretically harsh punishments aren't enough because Daniel Hale revealed how fucking awful the United States government is. The fact that Obama had a kill chain, there, there's a kill chain. The government has a kill chain. It's a hit list. What? That should fucking terrify you. You should immediately be like, what is this is not a government I want to support. And those people are justifying you know, this statement that it's not enough. Horseshit. So the prosecution also declined to dismiss four other charges um, just in case what he has pled guilty to doesn't get a harsh enough sentence. Right? Um, and, they're, and they're saying, well, well, you know, he's a national security threat. And and then everybody's like, well, what's the evidence that he's a national security threat? And they go, well, we did you not hear us say the words national security th threat? Because that's all the evidence you should need. Okay, we're the United States government. Okay, like, so whatever we say, you should just, like, take. Just, like, don't question it. We're actually trying to pass a law where questions are illegal. Okay, so like, just like, just take it for what it is. Then, I mean, then, then you have people that come out and are just like, well, facts are a myth, bro. Facts are a myth. Okay, it's like a mind puzzle. Like, what? They say stupid shit, crazy shit like that. It's like, but no, you can't. I don't know if you know how words work.
so here here's here's why this is significant is because uh daniel hale pled guilty to basically the largest charge and in in doing that uh they made an agreement with him they made a deal with him that the other four charges would be dropped clearly that's not what's happening clearly these fucking people lied go figure the united states government lied uh the prosecution is also claiming that they can't drop this this evidence. Uh, they can't drop the other four charges because they have secret evidence uh, that uh, he gave documents to ISIS. Everybody's like, wow, really? Well, where's this evidence? And they go, well, it's a secret. We can't just. Then it won't be a secret. And then it's just like evidence. So, boom, got you on that one. That is a that's what we in the biz call a legality. So, bam, you've been legalized, bitch. But they got fucking nothing. They got fucking nothing. So they're coming up with, you know, the the same old shit where it's like, oh well, maybe he joined because uh, you wanted to get classified information and, you know, he's a threat to national security and he, maybe he gave stuff to ISIS. It's a secret, though. And we can't reveal that because it's classified. It's like you got fucking nothing, then. Can't back up your claims in a court of law, then. So, so then they go... And they and they do another classic thing, which is uh, which is character assassination. So they're 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 assassinating his character by basically claiming that he wanted to have access to journalism so that he could be a rock star in the world of journalism for revealing these really cool secrets. Oh man! So so then so then they basically go, well, these whistleblowers aren't as good as you think they are uh, because they just reveal this information to like. Because they know, because they know it's, it's a panty dropper at the bars. Which, guys, I mean that is true. When I go to bars, I'm like, guys, I'm a, I'm a whistleblower, and the and the bar's like, wow, what did you, what whistles did you blow? And it's like, don't worry, but just know that I'm a a whistleblower. If look, if the United States government doesn't need to show actual evidence, then I don't either, right? I just go to bars, and I'm like, I'm a whistleblower, and they're like, what? whistles did you blow and i'm like it's a secret the people that got that joke are the true fans of the show <laughs> but they're care they're, they're doing the character assassination shit right like it what what there's no the, he gave it to a fucking journalist okay he gave it to jeremy scahill who's been really quiet about all this shit Kevin Gasola does a story about Daniel Hale, right? Like, I, comedians are talking about Daniel Hale. Activists are talking about Daniel Hale. But the guy that wrote a book and a series of articles, he, he cashed out by writing a book. Fucking silent. Totally silent. Really fucking weird. But he gave it to a he, he didn't go around parading this information. He's not sitting there and being like, guys, I'd really like it if you called me like a hero. He's not doing that. So even even their character assassinations are based on fucking nothing. They don't have anything. What they're trying to do is detract from the fact that Daniel Hale revealed that the American military has used drones to fucking kill innocent people. They are trying to detract from the fact that America has consistently committed war crimes nonstop. And they're using these distractions. We can see it, but there are people out there that don't, that need to be educated about it. That, that need to let go of this fucking fallacy that the United States military is out to do some good. They're not a fucking humanitarian organization. They're the fucking military. They're dudes with guns, dudes and ladies with guns, 
that want to go kill other people. That's their thing. That's what their mission is. They're fighting rich people's wars. Let's look at your comments. Holly says Daniel Hale is a hero. Uh, agreed. Yes, Daniel Hale is a hero. Julian Assange is a hero. Edward Snowden is a hero. Uh, Chelsea Manning is a hero. So these are we should be we should be living in a society that champions whistleblowers for revealing the corruption and how fucking broken this government is. Zozovic says he's got cooties and has poopy pants. So there, that is true. Uh, that is true, and I mean Zozovic said it. So you know, that's all the evidence we need. I've heard. I've heard that he's got cooties. Yeah, that's why. You, that's why in most photos you don't see uh, a lot of people around him, except for the photos that you do. Um, and obviously, those are uh, communist lies. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is being accused of having cooties warrants life in prison. Uh, if it's the government saying it, yes. Uh, Holly also points out they killed an American citizen by drone. Yeah, blew up a wedding, killed citizens. That's what they're using this technology for. I mean, that's that's essentially so. Essentially, the advancement of the drone program is to get rid of dissenters in the country. That's what they're going to use it for. That's where this is going. Like we are, we are heading to, there's so many aspects of what's going on around us from, from, you know, Texas trying to get rid of civil rights and suffrage and treat the, uh, teach that white supremacy is awesome to, to the fact that whistleblowers that reveal American war crimes are being treated as criminals so that the American military can expand and expand and expand and go into using drones that are just going to fucking murder people nonstop with using missiles that have spinning blades on them, which is just like, what overkill fucking, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger wet dream did you fucking concoct that shit in? They, they, they're criminalizing socialism. So if you're a socialist, you're considered a domestic violent extremist. I mean, they're using all this stuff to create a dystopia. I, I know I said this yesterday, but I have to keep repeating it. Look, books like 1984 are important, but we don't really get an accurate understanding of how we arrived to 1984. And guess what? We are living it. We're living in the 1984 prequel. That's what we're living. We're, our life is the 1984 prequel. If you want to wonder how you get to dystopia, this is it. We're in the midst of it, and we can stop it. Because the end result is what 1984 depicted. And we can stop it. Support people like Daniel Hale. You know, push back. Talk about it. Get out on the streets. Amplify this story. Tell as many people as you can. If there are people that shit on whistleblowers, correct the record. All right, folks, we are going to wrap things up here. Uh, I am uh, I am going to wrap it up. Uh, I've got two podcasts coming out. We got an interview with uh, with Jen Jaje, who is a Palestinian comedian. We're going to talk about her, uh, the show that she wrote that that's coming out tomorrow. Uh, I've got a dispatch coming out on Friday uh, and then I'm, I'm going to take the weekend to to hopefully re relax and enjoy myself and see some people I haven't seen in quite some time. Uh, I'm going to try to exercise tonight. I got a couple phone calls I need to make to family and friends. Um, yeah, jam-packed day. It's a bit, it's, it's, it's been a jam-packed few days. I'm very much looking forward to unwinding, um, you know, the, at the end of the week. Uh, so if you did enjoy this stuff, please do make sure that you hit the like button, share, and make sure that you're subscribed. Whether you're watching this on Rockfin Odyssey, uh, Facebook, YouTube, or the audio version, make sure that you are subscribed, especially if you're watching on YouTube, especially if you're somebody that watches my stuff on YouTube, please make sure that you're still subscribed on there. Uh, I want to send a special shout out and a big thank you to Indie Left News. They've been sharing my content out a whole bunch, uh, and that is super fucking cool of them to do. I really appreciate that. 
Uh, so shout out to Indie Left News. Follow them. Uh, they have a sub stack. They got a Discord. They're all over social media. Indie Left News. Uh, good, good, uh, you know, amalgamation of, of, of what content creators are putting out there. Uh, and if you want, uh, if you want a good aggregate site, uh, of, of, of news sources, uh, you know, like where I get my stories from and stuff, go to radindymedia.com, radindymedia.com. Uh, Lee Camp and Eleanor Goldfield and Christopher Johnson kind of made that. And it's, it's an aggregate site for a lot of really great, uh, lefty independent news. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes my videos get posted on there too, which is pretty, pretty fucking cool. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So, so make sure you like, share and subscribe that stuff. If you are on stable financial ground and would like to contribute and make a donation, you can do so over at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. Uh, you'll find a statement of transparency there that shows you how much I'm currently making in donations per month, how much I need and the closer I get to that goal, uh, all the cool stuff that I will be able to do because I don't have any sort of financial limitations. Um, you know, all my bills are, are would be taken care of. Uh, you know, I, I don't have other things that I need to worry about. And I can concentrate a lot more on creating content, uh, doing comedy and uh, and creating some comedy journalism and covering stories that aren't being covered uh, in your in your mainstream news. Um, so if you want to contribute to that, uh, if you become a sustaining member, you get free tickets to both live and virtual shows. So that's a big bonus. You also get unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content. You get some behind the scenes footage as well. A lot of cool stuff. Uh, but you know, if you can't, that's a hundred percent. Okay. Um, but you can sign up for my email list, which is a great way to receive updates about all the videos and podcasts and, and live shows and tour dates and, uh, sometimes I put put stories and essays in there as well. Um, so so that that is a good place for that. And the email list gets those essays and video and stuff first before anybody else does. So go to krishmohanhaha.substack.com for that. Uh, and again, live shows. Live shows are coming back August 14th, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Irma Freeman Center for Imagination. Uh, tickets are available for that now. Uh, October 6th, Lansing, Michigan, the Robin Theater. I'm going to be performing with uh, the very funny uh, and delightful Trisha Chamberlain. Uh, she's going to be on that show as well. Get those tickets right now. The The links are in the comment sections. They're also available directly on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. I'm adding dates all over the place. Uh, I've already got dates confirmed in Cleveland and Williamsport and Baltimore. I'm getting dates confirmed in D.C., uh, and, uh, uh, St. Louis, Huntsville, Memphis, Indianapolis, Cincinnati. Uh, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, uh, trying to hit up a, uh, as many cities as I possibly can, as long as things don't get crazy, uh, and, and things don't have to get shut down. So, uh, you know, that's, that's basically the caveat. A couple places I'm talked to they're they're like the numbers are going back up. So I'm a little I'm wary about booking some stuff, which, I totally understand, and and I'm I'm, I'm going to have to do a little bit better of a job of of paying attention to those numbers. So, uh, yeah. So keep an eye out for tour dates. Uh, but with all that said and done, uh, you guys are super fucking cool. Thank you guys for hanging out. We had Fred, Holly, Zozovix. Uh, we had we had Shane over on the old Facebooks. Uh, all the folks over on Odyssey, everybody at, at Rockfin, thank you guys for tuning in, and uh, we will uh, we'll see you guys soon. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other, and we'll see you on the road. Bye, guys. <laughs>